world in turmoil, God has the solution. And, well, I don't know about you, but what a week we've had. It's, it's been almost relentless. Uh, Mon Monday, Hurricane Ida crashed into Louisiana in, nor in North America. Second most damaging storm to hit Louisiana in its history, equal strongest landfall in terms of wind strength, second most damaging hurricane to hit the United States of America in history. That was Monday. Tuesday, the end of the Afghanistan war and the Taliban rejoice as America's longest war comes to an end. Somewhere during this week, let's say Wednesday, we hit a grim milestone in our uh, fight against this pandemic. The entire world is sharing it. Four and a half million people dead, according to some measures. More, according to others. A very grim and tragic milestone. Thursday, Hurricane Ida was not yet done with the United States of America. It had curled up across the United States of America and ended up petering out over uh, New York, 15, 1,600 kilometers away from Louisiana. That storm finished its work. And, and the amount of rain that fell in New York over the last few days, well, in Central Park, it broke a 94-year record, and there have been deaths all across New York from flooding. Thursday. Friday, a supermarket in suburban Auckland, six, seven now in critical condition as a terrorist takes his moment. And, and that was really all he had, 60 seconds, and he was dead. And yet that's all he needed. And we, we sort of think to ourselves, what a week. What a week. Except that the week before was just the same, and the one before that, and the, and the one before that, and the, and look, this cartoon really captures, I think, the way that people in our world feel at the moment. You know, if we just wash our hands, we'll be okay, we'll survive this COVID, and there's the tidal wave of COVID coming, but behind it is recession and behind it is climate change and behind it is our biodiversity collapse and behind it, behind it, wave upon wave upon wave of turmoil engulfing our world. It would be appropriate to feel pretty bleak about the outlook for our planet. Look, I think if you ask most people to rate 2021 so far, they would probably, even here in Western Australia, give it something like, what, <laughs> half a star out of five? Not, not a great year. And 2020 wasn't a great year either. The pandemic rages on. The environmental crisis is becoming more and more evident, whether you believe it was created by people or not. Economic instability grows. Just this last week, they've been talking about the reverse repo plot crisis in the United States of America, whatever that is. The threat to Australia from China, the threat of terrorism, the threat of disease, the threat of loss and personal harm. And, and for people, people out there, that sense of, of foreboding grows. They can feel, we can feel, almost as if someone, someone's got it in for this world. Where? Where is our world headed? It's, it's a question people should be asking. I want to share with you this evening a, a passage that I really love. It's a passage that feels, fills me with comfort when the world around me feels tumultuous and bleak and angry. It's a promise that God made. A promise that God made to the world. And it's a promise that says this, this image here, this is not the destiny of our world. This is, this is not where the turmoil is headed. It's not going to be the end for this earth. We read it tonight. 
Verse 9. They will not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. Fair enough. A holy mountain that will be peaceful. Low bar. But here's a high bar. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is a promise of a time when the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God. A genuine, deep, immersive knowledge. Not a, not a superficial knowledge. It doesn't say, and the earth will be varnished with the knowledge of God. A thin veneer of godliness. No, this is a knowledge that will change everything, everywhere in our world, like the water covers the sea. And what sort of a God will the, will the world know about in that day? Are they going to know about an angry God? An angry God with a kind of survival of the fittest mentality, allowing people to kick and claw their way to the top of his favour. A God who demands sacrifice and blood and death and pain. Of course not. That's not what the Bible says. This here is the writing of Jeremiah in, in one of the most bleak times that he personally experienced. A time of, of terrible grief and shame and loss. And he writes in the very middle of his grieving, he says, It wasn't God though. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassion does not fail. God's compassions, they're new every morning. And his faithfulness is great. That's a, that's a way of saying God, God's not going to change that. His love and his faithfulness and his care and his compassion that prevents those, from know, know, prevents those who know him from being consumed by this world. It, it will not finish. God is on the absolute opposite side to the forces of turmoil and cruelty that threaten to engulf our world. He stands. He stands against human greed. He stands against the violence of mankind to man, the casual brutality which rules every level of society today. No, he's a God of unfailing compassion who preserves those who know him and who love him. That, that's the God of the Bible. And the God who made that promise that one day the earth will be filled with the knowledge of him. Come across to another passage, Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, verse 10 to 13. Where he says, For as the rain comes down, and the snow from heaven and returns not thither, but waters the earth and makes it to bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth, says God. It will not return to me void, but it will, it shall accomplish that which I please, and it will, it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Poet, poetic language, instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it, these things, all these things, shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign, an everlasting memorial that nobody will forget. This, this memorial will never be cut off. This is the promise of God, that no matter how turbulent, how troubling our world gets, he has a solution. And what we want to do for the rest of our evening tonight is, is look at how that solution works. Here in this passage, God has described the hydrological cycle, written, by the way, in the 8th century B.C., 
The scientific description of, of how the, the water descends from the heaven and, and waters the earth. And, and, and God here says that the certainty of his promise being fulfilled, of his words being accomplished, is just as certain as summer and winter. As the seasons flowing one into the other, as rain and as growth and of all those natural principles and laws which govern our globe. He says, look, the likelihood of them changing is the same likelihood. As my promise not being fulfilled, it's not going to happen. My promise will be fulfilled. The world will be filled with joy, with peace, he says. So much so that it will seem like the mountains themselves are glad and the, and the trees are singing. That, that's how full of gladness this earth will seem. Indeed, nature itself, he says, once so red of tooth and claw, so full of thorns and thistles, will become gentle and prosperous. These things will be what the knowledge of God, the knowledge of God that fills the earth, will be based on. An enduring legacy of peace and of gladness worldwide. And, and you see, God's solution, God's solution to the turmoil in this world is the kingdom. It, it, this is a simplification. We, we simplify and we call this period of time that God talks about in the Bible, we use the word the kingdom or the phrase the kingdom to capture a whole lot of ideas and, and put them into one simple portmanteau, one suitcase of a phrase. This phrase, the kingdom, it's short for the worldwide kingdom of God. And it refers to both the period of time, the era, and the system of things. The government and the policies, the leadership, the citizens, the territory, the state of affairs of God's promised kingdom. And this subject, the subject of the kingdom of God, which will replace all earthly kingdoms, all the systems around this world, all of those things that today contribute and create the turmoil and tragedy which fills our globe today, that kingdom, it's the subject that is most among those most described in the Bible. You know, almost every book of the Bible refers to or alludes to this promised era in which God implements his solution to our world's problems and rescues our globe from all its turmoil. For example, these are the teachings of Jesus Christ. Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogue, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 4. Matthew 9, he preached the gospel of the kingdom. Mark 1, he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Luke, I must preach the gospel of the kingdom. The kingdom of God was the central message of Jesus Christ. In, in fact, if you look for that phrase, just that phrase, the kingdom, you'll find it shows up 102 times in the four gospel records. There are only 89 chapters in the gospels. On average, the kingdom is mentioned in every chapter of the Gospels. And it wasn't just Jesus who spoke about the kingdom over and over and over again. The book of Acts records the things done or the acts of the students, the disciples of Jesus Christ after his death and his departure. And it's evident from this historical record by, we believe, none other than Luke the man Luke, and, and from the letters that were written subsequently, that the kingdom of God was absolutely central to their worldview too. Those who followed Christ spoke again and again and again of the kingdom. Philip preached the kingdom of God. Paul preached, preached the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God was in the final message that the Apostle Paul gave to the Ephesian Ecclesia as he departed. And it's not just the New Testament idea. Again and again in the Old Testament it comes up too. Psalm 45, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Isaiah 9, his increase and in government will be endless. 
Daniel 2, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom on earth, he says. Obadiah, the kingdom will be the Lord's again and again and again. The Bible talks in, in very warm, passionate terms about this kingdom. Come across a few more pages. Isaiah 65. Oh, this one's a really nice one. This is, this is a beautiful passage. Isaiah 65, verse 17. For behold, says God, I create new heavens and new earth. Now, clearly this is not a reference to a newly minted planet, a brand new fresh universe just out of its cling wrap, but rather a, a new order, a new way of life in our world. It's a poetic way of saying things will be different. He says, I I'm going to make things different. The former will not be remembered. The, the world we know today, it'll be forgotten. It won't even come to mind. He says, but be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem, the most contested, the most controversial city in the planet. I'll make that a rejoicing. And her people, the Jews, universally reviled. I'll make them a joy. I don't know if you know, but when the most recent set of protests occurred against uh, the COVID lockdown in Melbourne, those protesters, some among those protesters put up stickers across Melbourne. And the protesters, the stickers that went up were Stars of David, in which was written 9-11. What do you think that means? Jewish stars of David with 9-11 written in the middle. A clear anti-Semitic sticker put up all over Melbourne, Melbourne in, our, in our country, in Australia. But here, God says, no, her people, the Jews, will be a joy for everyone. Verse 19, I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall be heard, shall no more be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that have filled not his days. People won't die young, he says, for the child shall die a hundred years old. You go to a funeral, oh, I was just a baby. Oh, how old was he? A hundred. <laughs> But the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and no one will take them. No, they'll live in them. They'll plant vineyards and, and someone won't invade and they'll lose their vineyard and it gets burnt down. No, they'll eat the fruit of them. They shall not build in another inhabit. They shall not plant in another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain nor bring forth for trouble. For they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass before they call. I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will hear. What an amazing passage. And it finishes, at the end of verse 25, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, the same as we saw in Isaiah 11. This new order of, of our world, as described here in this passage, it's so different to that today, isn't it? That that's so very different to the world in which we live. Even, even here in Western Australia, Sorrow and grieving are no longer considered an inevitable part of life. Life is considerably prolonged and premature death is no longer common. You don't ever in this world hear of children dying of COVID. The lives of this kingdom's citizens are lives of happy security, free from war and oppression, and good, honest labour reaps results. There's no 1% at the top, with 99% sinking ever lower. And most importantly, humanity finds meaning, a meaning so many struggle to find today. That's hinted in the words of verse 24. It shall come to pass before they call, I, God, will answer. There's, there's a world out there calling to God. And, and in this time, God hears them even before they open their mouths. There's a world who has a relationship with their creator. Everybody. What a world.
What an amazing time. The content of this passage, Isaiah 65, is repeated and expanded throughout the Bible as book after book, as author after author, adds support and detail to this wonderful description of a better future for our earth. Micah 4 says, everyone will sit under his own vine and fig tree. No one will make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of armies has spoken this. He's the defender of our globe's peace. The packs of God. And so the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on, even forever. What an amazing thing. E even here in Australia today, we're, we're increasingly feeling n more nervous about our security and our safety. Yesterday's Australian, the leading article in the commentary section was on how We've got nothing to defend ourselves should China invade. That, that's front page. And the people in our world are in, here in Australia are increasingly concerned about our own ability to defend. We haven't felt like this since the Second World War, that someone might need us to take up arms in this way but here god god is the defender of the world's peace jeremiah said therefore they shall come and sing in the height of mount zion streaming to the goodness of the lord for wheat and for new wine and for oil for the young of the flock and the herd their souls shall be like a well-watered garden they shall sorrow no more at all psalm 72 the king of this future kingdom will bring justice to the poor of the people. He will save the children of the needy. He will bake in pieces the oppressor. Look, this passage here talks about the, the absence of fear and sorrow. This one talks in awed tones of the king of this wonderful future. I can see him, says the author of Numbers. N not now. I behold him. But he's a long time down the track from the author of Numbers. He's a star and he'll come out of Jacob. He's a scepter of a king who shall arise out of Israel. And at this point in our presentation, we've had 22 passages on the screen about the kingdom. And you're hopefully starting to see the amount of attention that the authors of the Bible paid to this amazing subject, the kingdom of God. In fact, I think most of you would know that we've, we've barely brushed the surface. There are literally hundreds of verses devoted to this subject, the subject of a better future, the subject of the kingdom of God, the kingdom that God has planned for this globe. So what we want to do now is we want to turn to look at some of the world's most pressing problems. Those, those problems that are just insoluble for the politicians and the decision makers of our globe. And try and understand how God's kingdom provides a solution to these problems. Now, obviously, not everything we're going to look at has a direct connection within the Bible. For example, as far as I know, I know, there is no phrase climate change in the Bible. But we'll look at it nonetheless, uh, and I hope you'll follow along with me. So let, let's start with the elephant in the world, uh, the room, I mean. I, I don't think there's really a more pressing problem on anyone's mind out there at the moment than COVID. We're not going to spend any time tonight looking at the scale of this problem, the extent of the pandemic. I expect you're feeling like I am, overwhelmed with way too much news about the coronavirus. Pandemic news fatigue. But what we want to see is what the Bible has to say on the subject of disease and of dealing with disease in the kingdom that God will set up. And as I said, there is, to the best of my knowledge, no direct reference to COVID-19 in the Bible. 
The word corona does show up, but it's in a completely different context. So um, we'll leave that where it is. Um, however, it is true to say since the very earliest of times, God has promised that those who know him, those who have a relationship with him, will be saved from disease. Here's, here's a passage from the second book of the Bible, Exodus, very early in the history of the Bible. And, and here God, well actually Moses, speaking as the mouthpiece for God, speaks to his people and he says, if you will listen, if you'll diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God, if you'll do the things that are right in his sight, if you'll listen, give ear to his commandments and keep those rules, those statutes he's implemented. I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I have brought on the Egyptians. I am the Lord that heals you. Now, that's way back at the beginning of the story of the Bible. He says, look, if you listen to me, if you build a relationship with me, if you know about me, I can save you from your diseases. Or Psalms. These are the songs. It's a book full of songs in the Bible. Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems lives from destruction, who crowns people with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies our mouths with good things so that our youth is renewed like an eagle. What an amazing passage. Again, those that have a relationship with God, God promises that he can heal them and protect them from disease. But the Bible goes further than that. This is taken from the book of Revelation. And for those of you who know something about Revelation, it's admittedly quite a challenging book. Much of what is described in Revelation is described in symbol form. And yet, right at the very end, the final chapter, in fact, of this book, it describes the world restored to its beginning. Almost as if the whole globe has been rewound back to the condition it was when it was newly minted by God. The Garden of Eden, as it were, a peaceful paradise. And in the context of that description of a world restored, a world refreshed, the writer or the, the speaker of Revelation says, speaking of the city at the very heart of this new world, he says, in the midst of the street of that city and on either side of the river was there the tree of life which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded a fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. The healing of the nations. A tree that can heal whole nations. You might say, well, it's a book of symbol. Maybe it's an allegory for something else. But you see, this same idea is, is repeated it perhaps find its, finds its foundation in this Old Testament prediction, the book of Ezekiel. And in very concrete, prophetic language, Ezekiel is told that by the river, oh, there's a connection, upon the bank thereof, on this side and that side, it's, it's the same description. A, trees on either side of a river shall grow all trees for meat. Twelve manner of fruit, whose leaves shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed, that will bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, but the leaf for medicine. What a wonderful prediction. Medicinal trees. Trees that grow at the very heart of God's kingdom. This description here is a description of, of a scene that Ezekiel sees at the temple that God will establish in the new kingdom. And, and there, flowing out from underneath the rocky base of that temple is a river. And on the sides of that river grow these miraculous trees. Exactly the same description as Revelation had. Trees. That can heal. And for most of you, you've probably still got this passage open on your lap. 
Isaiah 65 verse 22. They will not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant or another eat. Look at this. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people. God's provision of healing to all in this future kingdom goes a very long way towards explaining this phrase in the passage that we'd already read. The day, how long does a tree last for? Assuming someone with a chainsaw doesn't show up. Hundreds of years, often. And this can only happen in a world in which disease is tamed, perhaps even conquered. The world of the kingdom promised by God. Okay. Let's take another problem, another pressing problem. Some of you will have seen this in the media recently. Rain falls at Greenland Ice Summit for the first time on record, and you think to yourself, it's Greenland, you know. If it's going to be green, it's going to have to have a lot of rain, right? But up on the peak of Greenland, apparently it never rains. Well, up until last week. What does it do up there? Well, usually it snows. For the first time ever, it was warm enough for it to rain. And that's, that's really concerned those who are looking for some solution to the global environmental crisis. Some of you will have seen this next animation, but um, I, I want you to have a look at this animation. What it's going to come up with is it's going to come up with um, a list of all the countries in the world. And it's, it's going to be an animation that runs very quickly from 1880 to 2019. And it's going to show you sort of like a, an average of their annual temperature. Was it above or below their sort of annual normal? So as we go through the 1900s, you can see yeah, a mix of aboves and belows, blues and oranges, blues and oranges, aboves and belows. And it looks sort of pretty random. Till we hit the 60s and the 70s. Not so many blues now, are there? Or any. It's pretty compelling, isn't it? Our world's temperature is changing for whatever reason. But it's going up and it's having effects. Here's a different visualization of the same thing. Annual temperature rises. And, and watch the sea in this one. Keep an eye on the sea. Have a look what happens there. Sea temperatures. Because you see, the, the sea is the great heat sink of our world. When the sea warms up, well, that's not great. Incidentally, for those of you who went to school uh, about 20 years ago, as, as I did, um, you'll remember that the conversation there was all about uh, global warming. We talked a lot about global warming at school, and, and you're, you're perhaps wondering why people have started talking about climate change and changed the language from global warming to climate change. Well, this is why. You see, there's, there's some cold patches and some hot patches. And you see, while all over temperatures are changing. Our world, world is really complicated. That change is not uniform. And, and this sort of climate change is resulting in some places being much, much hotter than they used to be, but others are colder or wetter or drier than they ever were before. And what we're seeing these days is greater variability, extremes of hot and cold. Not, not just global warming, hence the change in language. But, but I'm sure you've all spotted the difference. In fact, 1976, a, a really, really good year for a variety of reasons. Um, and 2016, spot the difference. And this here, this graph here sh shows year-to-date temperatures. So, you know, along the bottom, you can see January, February, April, June, August. It's tracking the year and it's showing you what the average temperature was globally for the year. And it's just going up and up and up and up, <coughs> little by little, 
Oh, it's only 1.6 degrees, but that's enough to mean that we're getting a Hurricane Katrina, a Hurricane Ida every first or second year. All right, uh, enough looking at the problem. I'm sure you've all dealt with this problem. Those of you in school, you've probably dealt, dealt with it to death. But nonetheless, our question is, well, how will God deal with that? It's all well and good to say that he's going to bring his kingdom, but that, that's no good if uh, the kingdom then declines into a, a, an environmental abyss because there's, there's too much global temperature. How will God fix it? Well, I don't have specific answers, but the Bible does have some really wonderful thoughts on this subject. We're not told exactly how, but there's some clues. For example, James refers to a story of the Old Testament in which this faithful man, Elijah, a man similar to us, prayed fervently that it would not rain, and it did not. Three years and six months, and then he prayed again, and it rained. You see, what, what we're being told in this passage is that God has got control of weather. God can switch the rain on and off. He, he, he actually invested that power in this man at one point in time, gave him the privilege of being able to pray for the rain to be switched off, and it did. And then to pray for it to be switched on again, and it happened. Or, or this story. Jesus and the disciples are out in a boat in the sea, perhaps not a boat that small, but nonetheless, a huge storm arose on that sea, threatening to kill all of them in its waves. These, many of the, the men on that boat were, were, were fishermen from way back, well equipped to handle the roughest of seas, but not this storm. They couldn't deal with it, but Jesus, Jesus, a carpenter by trade, arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still, and the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. He spoke and the storm stopped. Clearly, God is able to give his servants and, and use himself his control of the weather, the rain, the sea, the wind. All of these are in obedience and under God's control. And if he has control and the power to do that, surely he can deal with issues of the climate. So what might God do? Well, this is just a thought as well, but what you're looking at there is um, the weather on May, May uh, marches, marches throughout the year. So that's March 2017. It's, it's actually showing pollution over New York, I believe. March 2019, 2020. So what happened in March 2020? Anyone know? A little thing you might have heard of called a, a pandemic. And what you've seen on the screen there is a change in pollution caused by a reduction in industrial action caused by a virus, tiny little virus. God has tools at his disposal. And yes, I don't think that God will necessarily use a virus to, to cure the environmental problem. That might be counterproductive in some areas. But nonetheless, it is possible to very quickly reduce the amount that the earth is polluting. Here's one, one thought. Uh, this is uh, uh, the only... Um, photo we have of Tambora exploding in 1815, as you can see, actually, for those of you looking closely, it's not a photo, it's a painting. Tambora was a, a, a volcano that blew up in 1815. You might think, well, so what? Well, it was, uh, it, uh, I think it was in Indonesia. Um, it blew up in 1815. And this is from the daily weather broadcast in 1816, probably on French TV. Um, now, what you're looking at there is the weather pattern, the weather anomaly for 1816. And I know it's small, but hopefully you can see that there's lots of blues and purples. In fact, Europe experienced a significant reduction in temperature the year after Tambora exploded. And in fact, we've now tracked what happened. 
When Tambora exploded, it reduced global temperatures. In fact, it blew this vast quantity of, of a chemical called sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere. And when this chemical combines with water, it creates these sulfuric acid aerosols, kind of like this haze of tiny, shiny droplets. What they do is they reflect solar radiation back out into space again. And it's believed that this one volcano explosion may have reduced global temperatures by as much as three degrees that year. Three degrees, and we're worrying about a global rise of 1.5 over the next decade. Now, I, I, again, I'm not saying that God will use volcanoes, but I'm saying that God has tools at his disposal. Man could not use that. We, we, we couldn't safely trigger a volcano and hope to reverse global warming, but God can. I think this is very interesting. Now, this is a, a large piece of a scientific text from an article I found, but what it basically talks about is this, um, that rain, uh, rain falling on uh, leftover lava, um, igneous provinces as they're caused, can absorb, can cause the absorption of large amounts of carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is absorbed by, well, cold lava, effectively. God has mechanisms that allow for the reversal of the damage that humanity has done. And they're already in place. Now, of course, we know that there's more to the environmental catastrophe that our planet is facing than just CO2. But I hope what you've seen in the last few minutes is that, that God has got an arsenal of, arsenal of tools that is disposable that he can bring swiftly to bear to remedy the crisis our earth faces. And he can do it in a way that all of humanity combined could not. So one last problem. Global leadership. Global leadership is a, is, a, is a real problem. Our global leaders are often, well, obviously, corrupt, aren't they? This is a, a bit of a leaderboard of the most corrupt leaders in world history, and yet it leaves some of them off. For example, uh, it leaves off this leaderboard Putin, who is believed or alleged to have amassed around 285 billion in assets. You want to check those numbers for yourself. But nonetheless, that's a stupendous amount, making him easily the world's richest man, according to some. And he's managed to do that on $100,000 a year in payment from the Russian government. Quite a remarkable saver. <laughs> In fact, he recently finished the construction of a new home, which is just twice the size of Buckingham Palace. World leaders are often corrupt, aren't they? They're often incompetent. They are always beholden to voters and lobbyists, or alternatively, they're authoritarian. Leaders can only go one of two ways. And they're limited in term, even if only by age and by death. And they are limited, pardon me, they are limited also in resources. What a contrast. Come back to the passage we started with tonight, Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11 verse 1. There will come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch will grow out of its roots. The spirit of the Lord will rest upon the leader of the future age, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity the meek of the earth. He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked, and righteousness will be the girdle of his loins. What a contrast. Look at the key words that come out of the passage. 
passage, he's quick of understanding. In other words, he's not incompetent. He does not judge after his sight. In other words, he's not listening to lobbyists. He's not beholden to voters, but he's beholden to those who have no voice. The poor and those at the bottom of, down, of society. What an amazing thing. In fact, this leader will be incorruptible. The, the story on the screen describes how at one point, Jesus Christ, the king of this future world as promised in the Bible, was taken apart by someone described here as the de devil. And this person, whoever they were, offered him all the power in the world if he would just listen to the influence of this person, be influenced by someone outside himself. And he turned it down, despite the promise of being able to rule the world through this partnership. He is not able to be corrupted. And his followers took up the same lead. Simon, in this story, a corrupt magician, tried to buy the power that Jesus had given the disciples with money. And Philip, pardon me, and Peter, should I say, turned him down outright. Totally not interested in money. The followers of Jesus followed his lead in being unable to be corrupted. This man went to the cross. He died. At the hands of people, he had the power to kill. He said to them, and the Bible says very clearly, that the Son of Man would come in a cloud with power and great glory. He, it says elsewhere that he was able to call on 12 legions of angels, but he did not use that because to do so would be to use force to make a point that should not have been made. He had power to stop storms, and yet he never used that power to defend himself. And Luke says he'll be great, he'll be the son of the highest, he'll be given the throne of his father David, he'll reign over the house of Jacob forever. See, that's one of the problems, even when you get a great leader, eventually they get old or they get voted out, but not this one. So in our last few minutes, we want to say, what, what will the kingdom be like? What will it be like to be in the kingdom? Well. We're not going to turn up these references. You can get them from me later if you'd like. But I just want you to see some of the themes and the tones that come through in the scriptures about this time. There will be a united culture that replaces the divisive attitudes of our world today. One language, says Zephaniah 3 verse 9, culture unified by shared ce celebrations, says both Zechariah and Isaiah. There'll be one king that unifies people, no longer barracking for disparate teams. There'll be one God and a uniting shared religion and faith that brings all people together rather than dividing them over creed and over belief. There'll be reduced emphasis on divisive identity. People will no longer talk of race in terms that they do today. And there'll be the removal of polarizing subcultures, cultism and superstition and alternative faith. And all of those things that make barriers between people will be torn down, says Micah 5. And not only will we have a culture that values unity and faith and knowledge in God, but, but our foundation, the economy itself, will turn from being one of cruel capitalism to one of agrarian peacefulness. Micah talks of a semi-rural population. Zechariah talks of safe urban centres in which children can happily play in the streets without their parents having any fear of some harm coming to them. And, and people will have gainful employment. No longer will we have the situation where, well, there are the underemployed, there are the unemployed, and then there are those who are just in rubbish jobs, doing things that they know mean nothing. 
in the kingdom there will be meaningful careers for all. Now, this is a list of some of the careers that the Bible mentions specifically will be in the kingdom age. There'll be vintners and orchardists and shepherds, heritage building restorers, temple stewards, that that one is reserved for people of Jewish descent. But nonetheless, there'll be fishers and road builders and farm tool makers. There'll be plowmen and reapers and sowers and mariners. There'll be medical leaf, medicinal leaf transporters or dispensers and pharmacists. There'll be managers and team leaders, magistrates and singers. There will not be venture capitalists. There will not be corrupt politicians. There will not be lobbyists in the age to come or developers and designers of military hardware. And the fundamental demographics of the society and the world and the kingdom will be changed. People will experience very long lives. They will have large families because there will be low infant mortality. There will be many children in that age. And yes, there will still be a variety of wealth. There will still be rich and poor. But what will be absent from that society will be widows and fatherless because there is no more war, nor will there be chronic invalids. Because God will heal the sick. The wealth distribution will be changed because, yes, there will be rich and poor still, but the wealth will be centered in the king priest and in the class of those who are with him those who lead that society and and the defining characteristic of the king of kings who leads the king priests will be one of generosity these people are characterized by by one thing an attitude a spirit of proven willingness to sacrifice everything for others that is what qualifies people to lead in the age to come. Their, their willingness to sacrifice everything they have for other people. And so this is a society in which the person at the absolute pinnacle of leadership takes personal interest in those at the bottom. And so, yes, they will still be poor, but... But they will have a voice, they will have support, they will have protection from the king himself. It will be a stable, peaceful economy in which war is unknown. And in fact, it will be so peaceful that nature itself will be at peace with itself, as we read in our opening reading. And how will it do this? How will it feed a hungry world? The deserts will be turned to the forest, to forests. Isaiah 41 says, I will open rivers in desolate heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will plant in the wilderness cedar and the acacia tree, the myrtle and the oil tree. I will set in the desert the cypress tree and the pine tree and the box tree together. And here we have a picture of a world, well, a world that was once desert, now forested and green. And finally, he promises peace. A guaranteed peace from God himself. God says, moreover, I will make a covenant of peace, an everlasting covenant. And so as we wrap up our subject tonight, the final logical question would be, how do we become citizens of that kingdom? How, how do I become a participant in this new and better order? And, and of course, the Bible has an answer for this too. It is, in fact, an integral part of God's solution, the invitation of millions to be willing members of his kingdom. The answer is, well, it's here. We started, in a way, with this passage. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Given, given this is where we started tonight, 
It will probably come as no surprise to you to learn that being in God's kingdom, having the opportunity to be a citizen of the age to come, relies on knowledge, on a deep and complete understanding of the things concerning God. In fact, the king of the age to come himself said this. He said, look, this is life eternal to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, who God sent. And when he says that phrase, life eternal there, it's, it's an interesting Greek phrase, and it really means the, the life of the age. What he means is this. Weymouth, in fact, says that. It says, uh, in this consists the life of the ages, to live in, well, the age of the kingdom. In this, he says, consists the ability to be in the kingdom, a knowledge of the only true God and Jesus Christ. A deep and complete knowledge. We might even say a relationship with him. For students often form relationships with their objects of study. And so a relationship with God and his son, this will be the foundation of citizenship in his kingdom. A kingdom which is God's solution to a world's turmoil. Thank you.